Good evening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the world premiere of the open night, night presentation of Belushi by director RJ Cutler at the 56th Chicago International Film Festival. I just came from the drive-in screening where audiences enthusiastically received the film. Lots of honking and flashing lights, it was really fun. My name is Mimi Ploche and I'm the artistic director of the Chicago International Film Festival. We're very much looking forward to tonight's post-screening discussion of the film. We have with us here director RJ Cutler, Judy Belushi, and Ivan Reitman. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the John and Jacqueline Buxbaum Family Foundation for supporting this film in the festival, and also a big and sincere thanks to Showtime for sharing Belushi with our audiences. It is a penetrating and engaging portrait that captures both the genius and the complexity of beloved Chicago icon, John Belushi. Thank you. So this is just the first of 12 straight days of fantastic cinema, whether you're here in Chicago at the drive-in or wherever you may be in the US streaming our films. So uh, sit back and enjoy. And now please welcome senior programmer of the Chicago International Film Festival, Anthony Kaufman. Anthony. Hi, thanks Mimi. Uh, so everyone, uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, we are really honored to have with us uh, the director of the film, Belushi, R.J. Cutler, Emmy-winning documentary filmmaker of such great docs as the September issue, the series American High and Listen to Me, Marlon, Judy Belushi Pisano, author, designer, singer-songwriter, and you hear her voice in the film, and uh, producer, Oscar-nominated producer, Ivan Reitman, who has made, you know, some of the best classic comedies in American cinema, Ghostbusters, Animal House, Stripes, Heavy Metal, and Up in the Air more recently, which he was nominated for an Oscar. Thank you so much for, for coming. Um, so uh, the way this will work is we'll chat for a little while and then as questions come in, I may weave in some of those questions into the discussion. So um, we'll, we'll be able to get to your questions as, as well out there in, in the audience. So RJ, let's start with, with the film. Uh, let's start with the, the conception of the film, how you got involved, and I know that the project was in the works for a while. So why were you the person that kind of greased the wheels here? Uh, well, uh, I'm, 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 I think uh, circumstances greased the wheel and timing greased the wheel. And um, uh, I was uh, I produced a film called Listen to Me, Marlin, with uh, my dear friend and the producer of this film, John Batsik. It was directed by Stephen Riley and. Uh, we were coming to the end of that experience and talking about what we might do together next and had lunch and kicked around a couple of ideas and, and, and very quickly started talking about John Belushi, who had been such an enormous influence on both of us. I mean, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I had two magazine subscriptions. One was to Sports Illustrated, the other was to the National Lampoon. And and, uh, and I, I, I followed the New York Mets through Sports Illustrated and, and uh, but my worldview was formed by the National Lampoon. And, and uh, through the magazine, I found the radio hour. And so I was familiar with John's work early on and recognized his name in the credits. And then of course, when Saturday Night Live came along, like so many millions of others, my, my, my mind was blown and, and, and on and on. So I was so excited at the, uh, at the idea of, of possibly doing a film and John, Batsik explained to me that he had been in hot pursuit of permission to make a film from Judy for the better part of a decade, um, that he had been calling her uh, annually, if not more often, to see if perhaps she had uh, come round to his idea that it would be uh, a, a terrific, it, that John's story would make a terrific film and the time was right. And uh, from what I understand, uh, uh, Judy kindly, had uh, had had avoided his charms throughout that period, um, uh, even once uh, sending him to have lunch with Jim, who uh, who 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 scared him off for the rest of that year, and um, and uh, but when uh, John uh, uh, approached Judy, and she'll have to tell the story from her perspective, um, uh, with the idea of us uh, coming back to do it again, uh, um, and sent her. Listen to me, Marlin is an example of the work that we had done together. She she revealed to him that she, <laughs> since his last call, she had agreed to make the film with a couple of other people, um, and uh, Bill Couturier and Sean Daniel. And fortunately, um, uh, we were all able to kind of work out a way to work together. 
Bill and Sean are among our executive producers. Sean, of course, was was uh, hands on in the throughout uh, the experience of, of of Animal House and the Blues Brothers as a as a film executive, and uh, is a good friend. Um, and um, and and off we went to make the film. So, Judy, I'd like to hear from your perspective. You know, uh, why agree to? Uh, give all of this precious information to these guys to make a movie? Well, I had uh, begun collecting interviews uh, with friends and coworkers uh, shortly after John died. I think the first year I did my first group and most all those were recorded in New York City and I was working at that point with uh, MTV. We did a little document, a little uh, thing on him uh, for MTV called uh, John Belushi Rock and Roll Actor. And I retained those interviews. And then I went on, I went to Chicago to the Second City, did Bernie Solons, the director of the, and uh, people John had worked with and family members. And later in California, I did some more. Um, I, I wanted to get fresh memories and I knew I, I wanted to have a doc. I, I thought I would do that documentary, but over the years, I, I found no one really wanted me to do that. Um, they just assumed to be a whitewash kind of happy go lucky little look at his life and i uh, just really couldn't get what i wanted for that at the same time um i also didn't want to do a doc when john first uh, approached me john batsick because it just wasn't good timing for me personally and that was true for a number of years and as that began to lift and i began to consider redoing it it so happened that uh, as as RJ mentioned, two others came in, and one being Sean Daniel, who had not only been the vice president from Universal on Animal House, but he he's the person who's president of Universal when he uh, bought the Blues Brothers from a phone call that John and Dan made. So when his name got involved, I thought, oh, yeah, that, that would be good. Well, let's do that. And then John popped up, and I thought, dang, how can this work? And I didn't know how it would work, but uh, John made it work, and I'm really pleased with that. And, and when he brought in RJ, he suggested RJ. I mean, from my perspective, that was perfect because I felt that it wasn't just uh, that John's, he, he was a wonderful actor, comedian, uh, writer, a number of, in the arts, but he also, I think, holds a place in the culture uh, that's important. And I, and I felt from RJ's work uh, with political issues that he would see that. And of course, he also was involved with the television show Nashville. So the music aspect was important as well. And so it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> the uh, Judy, you know, you mentioned the sort of iconic um, role that that um, John Belushi has in kind of history of American comedy, and I, I think that leads to me a question for Ivan. You know, uh, and you know, when did you see that? Did you know was that emergent? Was that emergent to you uh, early on? You know. If you could talk a little bit about how how you saw that growth uh, from just some guy doing crazy stuff to to someone who who was iconic. Well, I was really lucky. It was it was the mid seventies. I I had really done a Broadway show, believe it or not, mm -hmm. called The Magic Show with Doug Henning, and I had done one small movie that was self financed for about ten thousand dollars called Cannibal Girls, and it was a comedy horror movie. I think it's still available somewhere. And uh, I remember calling up Maddie Simmons, who was on the masthead of the National Lampoon uh, magazine. I said, look, uh, you guys, I love your magazine. I'd love to do a comedy movie about that. I'm a film director. I've got a Broadway show. I hadn't done anything. And um, he, he was kind enough to bring me into a meeting. He was always very open that way. He said, look, uh, a lot of people are calling me about movies, but you've done some theater, we had this big hit in Lemmings and we want to do a new show called the National Lampoon Show, which was going to be an off-Broadway kind of, and it's, and it, and he, he it was chosen uh, from the people from the National Lampoon Radio Hour. And, and really, I, I remember meeting all of them the very first time. And it was John, who was basically directing the show and organizing the whole thing. He was kind of the boss. And of course, there was Bill Murray, his brother, Brian, Harold Ramis, and I'm forgetting somebody, and Gilda Radner, how can I forget? And um, I remember going to this sort of first rehearsal and it was just, 
it was spectacular. And I couldn't keep my eyes off of John, who would occupy that space. Um, and it really came to it really came to fruition the very first night we played in front of an audience. And it was really like I was watching Marlon Brando. I know you've done a, a movie about him. You understand. He had this magnetic way of just, and everybody deferred to him. You know, you had a very talented group of actors on there with him, but he was clearly in charge. And it, and he did it in a very friendly and, but very magnetic and wonderful way. And so that was the, that was the first time I said, holy, I'm so lucky. I've, I'm meeting these people and they were so talented. I said, um, I said, it's going to change my life. And it did. And uh, everything sort of flowed from that very first show. I'll tell you, one, apart from the fact that they were very funny and, and John was remarkably funny, I mean, he was, he thought of himself as the producer as well. He would call me. I was living in Montreal at that time and commuting back to New York for the show. And if there weren't enough, you know, posters up or if I hadn't spent enough money, and selling it, he would call me up and just sort of berate me for an hour on a on Sunday. And I would promise, look, we'll we'll make sure that there's enough advertising, it's gonna do very well. And in fact, it did very well. It was quite a sensation. It's so it's so interesting. I I, I you 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 touch on such kind of uh, fundamental things about John and those stories, one being that 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 of all the people he admired uh, growing up, uh, Bob Newhart, Jonathan Winters, it was Brando who he it felt like he most aspired to be, and and you you saw that, and and there's that moment in the film where where uh, he's asked uh, who is who is John Belushi? Gene Shalit asks him, and he says, "I'm just an actor," and and you know that he's 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 channeling, channeling Brando. But the other thing is that that. It, this this man, we think of him as one of the great comic talents of all time, of course. Um, and and but but what he really was was a visionary. What he really was was a director producer. What he really was was a gatherer of people and and who would and then inspire them with his vision to to you know reach great heights. I'm struck by the fact that all the people you mentioned were essentially gathered by him first from Chicago, from Toronto, from New York, and uh, and they went on to to uh, have such uh, impact on the world's culture. What I love about your film is that it really captures that sort of organizational, kind of directorial, producerial um, uh, weight that he has, you know, that he thought in those terms. He wasn't, you know, uh, he would be very much involved in the blocking of the shows. Um, uh, right from the beginning, uh, I'll just, I went to one of the rehearsals and I was an outsider. I was a guy who's done nothing in Toronto and uh, they were working out one of these scenes, a sketch. And at some point they were asking each other some question and I had the temerity to say, hey, don't you think it would be better if, and I can't remember what I said, but I said, made a suggestion. Literally they all stopped and they just turned to me like I had farted in the room and I said, they just said, actually it was Bill Murray who came up to me. It's very funny that I've now made five movies with him, but he put his arm around me very carefully, very lovingly. And uh, he actually, this is your scarf, right? He took my scarf, wrapped it dangerously around my neck. He said, Look, nice, nice suggestion. We'll talk to you a little later. He, just he kind of walked you to the room. room. <clears throat> hmm? And they kind of walked you to the door. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, there was a question uh, from the audience. I'll, I'll fold a couple of questions in here, actually. One was, if Bull, if there were any Bill Murray, um, uh, you know, recordings or or, or, or interviews that, that you uh, dug up, someone wanted to know if he, um, yeah, if, and if there were other people that maybe you wanted to include in the film that, that were not included. Oh, there were many who I would have liked to have included, but um, and some of whom we actually had interviews from, but couldn't use them all. And, and some I didn't get to interview. I did interview Billy in New York City, but um, I, I've said I, we were doing a benefit uh, for the John Belushi Scholarship Fund for Second City, and uh, 
it was at the Hard Rock Cafe and it was very noisy in the room we did the interviews. And so sadly, those interviews were unusable. We did. We, you know, the 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 question of the, using these interviews is was really kind of fundamental to the experience of making the film because prior to uh, Judy inviting us to the vineyard where we kind of found this box full of these interviews, of course she knew she had done them. It wasn't a it wasn't a surprise that they all existed, but we we didn't know until we got there and then started and then we didn't know what was on them until we started listening. Um, I had I had done a few preliminary interviews and had met with people and talked to them and my experience was that that so much of what I was being told was kind of existed in the hazy fog of memory it was decades uh it was decades since it was um the the the, the there, there wasn't the immediacy and the rawness that I knew this film needed and um, and stories were a little bit the kind of the stories one tells about one's experiences with John, more so than they were, um, again, fresh memories, uh, as Judy says, which was her objective when she first started doing the tapes, but it had been, again, decades since she had made them. And, um, and then when I heard the tapes, it, 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 that was that. Because there in the tapes was the was the immediacy was the rawness that a film about John Belushi requires. That that then the mystery, of course, became how do you the tapes don't come with pictures, and this is cinema. So how do you bridge that gap? And and of course you 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 see the results in the in the uh, the, the, the animation of Robert B Valley, the extraordinary. Uh, uh, um, uh, graphic work of, of how the stills are animated and moved that Stefan Nadelman did. It's the, it, the music, all of it. And we were able, once all of the pieces were put together, in a way, it doesn't matter that the, that the voices are without picture. In fact, in a way, it, 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 um, I think it, it, it enhances the experience. It lives so much in the right brain as opposed to talking heads. So it was a very exciting riddle and puzzle to figure all that out. Well, the, RJ, the film feels a bit like a, um, I mean, a lot of it feels like a time capsule. A lot of it has this sort of nostalgic feel, I think. I'm wondering um, what you think that lends the the sort of, the the, the experience that, that people have for the film. I mean, I mean, I wonder, and, you know, Ivan and Judy have I mean, watched it, whether it sort of brings you back. I'm sure. Well, it's really, uh, the story of the sort of first 10 years of my career in a different way. I mean, we were very close for about four or five years and then our careers really separated. You know, I had always wanted to direct Animal House. I'd worked on the script first with Harold Ramis and, and with Doug Kenny and then later brought in Chris Miller. And it was always sort of my hope. And that was my original deal with the National Lampoon was that I was going to get first opportunity to direct it in the way I got to produce it, frankly, was the deal spoke. To, my deal was that if any portion of a movie that was going to be made had part of the National Lampoon show that I was producing on it, I would get an opportunity to direct it, and I would at least produce it. And, you know, most of the cast was hired by Lauren Michaels for Saturday Night Live, and Harold Ramis was not. He was working, I think, for... Uh, at PBS at that time. And uh, I called him and I said, look, I want to do this movie. I'm going to, I'm, I think we can do a funny movie based on the sketches that are in the Lampoon show. And we started just working together, trying to tie that all together. Then, then I talked Maddie into doing the, um, the high school yearbook uh, movie, which is because it was the most popular thing that the National Lampoon had ever done. And, uh, and it was, it was so grote grotesquely R-rated that we thought, well, it shouldn't be a high school movie. We should probably make a college film. And that's really where the fraternity idea came about. And, uh, and that's when Chris Miller got involved. But, uh, yeah, there was lots of, lots of things in the, in the film that sort of really touched me, made me cry, frankly, and uh, just reminded me of these extraordinary days. And frankly, how lucky I am mm. to have lived through that and to have 
gotten to meet John and all these very, other very talented performers. Did did either of you wanted to respond to that? This I don't know the idea of the, this. It feels very nostalgic. I didn't live through that period exact. I mean, I I kind of did, but I wasn't exactly aware. And even for me, it's nostalgic. Hmm. I wouldn't say it's nostalgic for me so much. Um, <laughs> it's, um, there's so many different levels. Uh, I, I've actually only watched it twice. And the first time was over a year ago. Um, I watch it for, from a very different viewpoint. That's all. Of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. RJ, anything you wanted to add? Well, you know, our, 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 uh, certainly the ambition was to be experiential um, for the viewer. Uh, that's, that's part of the film's concept. Uh, it, I, 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 I wanted it, as I said, to be as raw and as immediate as John was. I wanted you to feel the, as though you were experiencing the performances and, and, uh, as though, though, though you're, I, I agree with you. It is a, it's, it's a film that transports you to another time. I wanted you to feel as though that time were right now. So this was, this was again, where the accident of no talking heads really helped us because the story had to be told, but it was told by those who were uh, um, very close to the experience they were describing. And it had that, it had that immediacy. And, you know, it, it, of course, for those of us who did live through the time, there's an emotional connection because it's very, very personal, whether you experienced it as Ivan did and in the first person uh, or, or as I did as, as a, uh, you know, as a, a teenager coming of age who was so impacted of this and and well into my into my twenties and and of course for Judy it's unique because it's her story. Yeah, the subject always has a uh, a, a unique relationship to these films. I'm wondering, in terms of the time the time period, do you think there was something about that time period that somehow lent itself to like a transform transformational moment in American comedy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember uh, John Landis and I would talk about, you know, how this was really the, that Animal House was really the, this first American movie that really spoke uh, in a language of the, of the post-war generation. If you really look at comedies prior to Animal House, you know, it's Bob Hope and it's, uh, I can't even I go through the list, but they, First of all, there weren't a lot of them, particularly in the 60s. It was a pretty serious period. And there wasn't anything that really spoke like our generation, the post baby boom generation. And um, it it really changed things. And of course, Saturday Night Live, it, it really started with the National Lampoon. The National Lampoon really was kind of this wonderful sort of collection of stories written by really smart people, many of whom started at Harvard, but also started they were like those smart guys all over, and mostly in college of that period that sort of wanted to change that sort of, that war, you know, that post-war generation and that squareness. And um, it, it, was, it was the sort of comedy way of dealing with, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And um, in a strange way, I, I, and, your film made me think of this a great deal is that, you know, Animal House was great for John. It sort of really catapulted him further into the stratosphere of fame. But in a strange way, he became the victim of that success. And and there was an expectation by everybody he ran into and everybody who wanted to hire him and do things with him was that he was going to be Bluto. Mm -hmm. and, and as you suggested, he really was Brando. I mean, here's a guy who was destined to do Brando and he stuck doing Bluto. And he tried to do it by the end of his career, but things got cemented too much. And, and tragically, he had a very short career. And so unlike Bill Murray, who's, who's been able to sort of live through that process and now is just doing more serious work, wonderful work, that sort of expanded his, um, his actor's language and his performer's language, you know, John got very little opportunity for it. And well, you know, I'd like to go back to your question and say that, you know, John, 
uh, was a child of the 60s, a teen, a young adult of the 60s. I mean, he was completely uh, anti-Vietnam War. Before I, I had older siblings who talked about being anti-war, uh, but he was the first in my group of friends to say, I'm not going to, he, to the, you know, I won't go. And he went to Canada and scoped it out where he would go if he, if he was drafted. Um, he, his humor, when he was first uh, started his own improv group, it was, they were very political. They were very, um, they were, it was the name of the, the other people in this group was uh, Belushi, uh, uh, Insana, Belushi, Bashekas, and Insana. I mean, they were a very ethnic group. <laughs> they did a lot of ethnic humor as well. They were very different. And um, he, he, that underlying revolutionary in him, uh, the, 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 the anarchists, uh, was prevalent throughout. And I think as he uh, did hit his fame, I, in a way, I feel he's a microcosm of sorts of, of, the, of our country. He was young and raw and ambitious and had so many and, and, and had new ideas and, 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 and ambition and uh, a kindness and all sorts of things that I think this country also represents. But at the same time, he got caught up in, in something else. He got caught up in the money and the, uh, the power of what was around, the, the lack of power uh, and the confusion of that time. Ultimately, he destroyed himself. And I think there is some kind of similarity there that we're in a, in a phase now that we need to think about ourselves and what's going on. And that's going a little far out, 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 out of our conversational realm here, probably. But that, that I feel, is something we're thinking about. Uh, and, and also, uh, in addition to what the, you, the, uh, Judy and Ivan are identifying in terms of the 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 uh, impact and the influences that created the impact that John had. He also, again, was the visionary. When you get to the Blues Brothers, it's this kind of it presages performance art a decade before performance art really even exists, and it's so it's so mind blowing. That's why we began the film with the uh, uh, the Universal Amphitheater performance. It's it, the performance is great. The footage is, to have that footage is amazing. But the audience, the delirium in the audience reflects this sense that nobody quite knows what they're witnessing, what they're experiencing. They know there's great music. They know there's awesome performers. They, they, it, it isn't comedy, but they're, they're, they're giddy. They're thrilled. They're, they're jumping up and down. It's, it's, you, you kind of, you don't see that at a, music performance. You don't see that at a comedy show, but you did see it at the Blues Brothers. And that's what another thing that John did. And 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 what that suggests, of course, is is part of the tragedy of the film, which is 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 what was lost because he was he was of his time and ahead of his time simultaneously. Great. Yeah. Um, so uh, as we uh, wind up, I, I want to get in some audience questions. Um, and there's a good one here, which I think speaks to the, kind of what we're what what we're touching here. Someone says, "Steve, we never knew about his pain. Was that pain a source of his genius?" I think it's kind of in the film, but I think it's a worth worth discussing quickly. Yeah. I don't know. I I don't know. Um, I don't think so. But I think that the pain certainly drove his personality. Um, I'm not sure what that pain was. I've thought about it a lot. You know, I, there was a whole, uh, I feel it was probably a spiritual, lack of a spiritual direction, but I'm not, you know, that's just from my years of thinking about it. I'm not, I can't say. I found him very joyful. You know, yes. uh, I was fortunate to know him in those sort of great first sort of five years. And I mean, one of my favorite stories and i'm reminded of it every single year at thanksgiving was when we were shooting animal house john and judy had a home in eugene oregon that they rented for our shooting and they inv invited the whole cast and most of the crew uh for a home cook to thanksgiving dinner and it it was so lovely and it was so familiar it was so much about family 
you know, people often ask me, well, he must have been really, must have been really wild to be on the set of Animal House. And in fact, we shot it in 30 days. It was very organized. He was prompt on, you know, he was absolutely professional uh, through the whole thing. And they, he clearly had a loving relationship with Judy. And and it was wonderful to that they shared that sort of family uh, holiday with all of us. And it sort of brought that sense of family to everybody uh, during that shooting. Uh, I don't know. He was just... Uh, People, he was a real professional and um, had so much skill and it really broke my heart to see him sort of go off the wagon, so to speak. Yeah, I'd say, I, I think too, that he was a very joyful person. He did have a pain that, that, that threw him off track at times, but it wasn't the overriding part of his life. I mean, oh. mostly when I, you know, and it's easy to, with time, let those happier memories, memories, you know, become the ones you're you're gonna keep close because they're so lovely. But I'd have to say he was mostly a joyful person. Judy knows uh, how much I love this kind of uh, another one of these iconic uh, John stories that you see throughout his life, which is people say from 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 when he was a boy, you'd invite John Belushi somewhere and he'd show up with eight other people, okay. and bring he'd bring family along he'd whether it was the the school play or football practice or the band or or wherever there was john belushi and a gang would form and that gang was his was was family and and we see of course he did it i mean ivan just told us the story of how he did it in his in his professional life as well and and it's the stories told over and over again and there's that amazing super eight footage in the film of of a holiday gathering in your apartment in New York, Judy, and 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 you see it there too, um, and everyone's clearly having a good time. So, uh, RJ, someone asked actually, uh, how many hours of footage uh, did you collect in the making of the film? Well, this is you know usually you can answer that because you're you're shooting or you're doing you know there there were fifty hours of audio tapes, uh, and then there was you know. <laughs> months of research months and months and months of research so it, it measures differently um because uh the and then it was a question of of uh we it need it needed density this was a life story that needed density but it also needed uh incredible energy and and emotion um and again that's where stefan nadelman's work comes in he did the graphic movement of all the imagery and and it's where Robert Valley's animation came in, which was uh, so so uh, meaningful to the film. So it's hard to answer that in the traditional kind of documentary way. So there's a question from Rachel, uh, actually Judy, about the the song uh, "Best Days." Uh, did you record that specifically for the movie? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> I actually had wanted to play it for RJ the night before we did my last uh, interview because I was finding it very difficult to get into a mindset to do this interview. I really didn't want to do it. I felt distant. I felt that uh, I've been sort of just uh, trying to make certain changes in my life, change up my work, get, uh, I had just begun songwriting and I really wanted that to be the focus. And this particular song was sort of a um, an autobiography. It's sort of like, I can now say my life in seven verses. <laughs> I don't, I don't you know. and, uh, and, and that's really, so um, I ended up playing it for him and uh, I had no, uh, no thoughts or any ideas that would use it. It didn't seem to make, I, that I didn't compute at all. Like how, why would, what, where would they use it? But he did. It reminded me when uh, Judy played, of course, I was deeply moved and, um, and when we got back to the edit room, we we instantly put it over the credits, and it worked beautifully. It kind of reminds me, oddly, of the the final moment in in Hamilton when Eliza kind of takes center stage, and and the spot hits her, and she re re um, she reconnect re takes over the narrative. She has that final moment, and I I just found it deeply moving, and and there it is. Okay. I wasn't sure it was 
it wasn't a, it was just a real impromptu performance and not particularly certainly not flawless but uh I, I, I had a few people listen to it. I said, I don't think it's very good. What do you think? And they said, I think it has a quality that works. <laughs> and I try someone else. What do you think? I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. The, 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 the final print came back and, uh, and somehow in the processing, the, the giggle at the end had been lost. Oh. And, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad I listened to the last frame because <laughs> I, it's, it's pretty much the last frame. And, yeah. and so we sent it right back and we got it and we were able to restore it because of course the, that, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, it probably goes without saying, but RJ, why was that important to make sure I was there? Uh, I'll encourage people to watch it to the end and, uh, and, and, and say for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right, thank you, uh, RJ. Thanks so much for making the great movie, Belushi, we're so happy to open the festival with it. We're so honored, Anthony, really, to, 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 bring, to bring John home in this way and to bring a, home Yeah, home. it was a perfect, uh, yeah, a perfect. I'm just thrilled that it was Chicago and I, I wish I could have, we could have been there. I would have loved to be able to uh, interact with the Chicago audience. Um, yeah. I'm forward to hearing from people, uh, however, however that comes around, I'll be listening. Uh, they can find you on Twitter, I saw. Okay. <laughs> I've Twittered like seven times in my life, so I'll look. I'll try to follow Judy, people. Follow Judy. Yeah. Ivan, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Ivan, so much. Yep. Yeah. Real thank pleasure. You. Yes, thank Ivan. You. Nice to see you. Thank you. Right. Take care. Goodbye-bye.